So before we get started, I am your presenter. My name is Scout Kirby and I am a wildlife educator and AmeriCorps member that serves with the Nevada Department of Wildlife here in Reno. And today we are going to be talking about uh, the social and habitat preferences that some of our elusive animals in Nevada, what kind of habitat preferences and social preferences they're going to have. Um, and this is part of a series. So this is part two of a four part series that I'm doing that each one is going to focus on some different adaptations that are going to make our animals more elusive and highlight different elusive species that we have in the state. So to go over what happened in our first program, um, the main theme was that Nevada is an extremely diverse state, even though it doesn't seem like it to many people. So we're ranked 11th in biodiversity in the United States, meaning that we have a really diverse amount of both plant and animal species. Um, we're also ranked sixth in the number of endemic species in the state, and those are going to be species that are only found in Nevada and nowhere else in the world. So they're really unique species. Um, and then we also discovered that Nevada has a lot of limited, a lot of limited resources. And the resources that are limited are going to limit the amount of habitats we have um, and also the animals we have and the different adaptations they're going to develop. So some of the adaptations we went over were those habitat and social preferences, activity patterns and physical traits. We went over these kind of in a more general view. And so today we're going to get more into depth and in the other programs we will as well. Um, but the overall theme of this series is going to be that the diversity in Nevada is going to be harder to observe. So you're going to have to take into account a lot of different things in order to go out and view our elusive wildlife. So another thing we talked about in the introductory program was the app iNaturalist. Um, and it was basically just me explaining how I've used that app both to identify different species um, explore different areas and learn about the different animals that they have in those areas. Um, and then you can also use it like I'm using today to help um, with people going out and finding elusive animals in the state. And so we talked about these two different apps, the iNaturalist app and then Seek by iNaturalist, which is a little bit more user friendly. iNaturalist is a little bit more technical. So if you have more experience, um, with wildlife identification, I would recommend using iNaturalist, um, especially if you're going to be going out and looking at wildlife with kids, I would recommend using Seek by iNaturalist. Um, but they both work in the same way. Um, so they are citizen science projects that are partnered between the California Academy of Sciences and the National Geographic Society. And the gist of what the project is, is they want regular citizens to go out and take pictures of the plants and animals that they see around them. You can then upload those pictures and other uh, naturalists as well as scientists can help you to identify them or they can verify your, uh, your identification if you know how to identify animals already. Um, and then those will get sent out and so people can use them as resources to figure out where different animals are in the state. So today I'm not going to go over um, how to use those apps again. If you would like to see that kind of tutorial that I did, um, you can look for that video when it's uploaded on the Nevada Department of Wildlife's YouTube page. They'll be uploaded in the webinar series. Um, but that, as far as I know, has not been uploaded yet. Um, and I'll have a page at the end that'll have the link to where you can find those YouTube videos from past webinars. But for today, I am going to be mainly using the iNaturalist webpage because it has a lot more information that you're not going to be able to get on either of the iNaturalist or the Seek apps. Um, so if you type in this um, right here at the top of your browser, browser, you'll get this webpage, which is specific to Nevada. So if you go on iNaturalist, you can just find an overall kind of world page that's going to have a bunch of different observations throughout the world. Since we are in Nevada, we're going to be focusing on our species. So you can type in and go to the Nevada US state checklist. And here you can see all the different animals that have been observed in the state. Um, you can also see up here that of the 4,119 species that are listed in Nevada, only 3,213 have been observed. 
So even if you don't find a species on here and it doesn't have observations, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not in the state. It just means it might be even more elusive than some of the ones we'll talk, we're talking about today. Um, but you can go to this menu and click on whichever specific group of animals you want to look at. So if you wanted to look at mammals or if you wanted to look at vertebrates in general, you can do that. Um, otherwise, you can click on any of these um, species and it'll bring you to this little blurb that gives you some general information. So it'll show you the state of Nevada and where the observations are in the state. Um, it'll also give you some information on when that animal um, had its first observation and also when the last observation was submitted. Um, and then you can get more information in terms of looking at the different photos that have been submitted um, and getting direct information from specific observations, clicking on this tab. If you um, exit out of that blurb and just go back to the general homepage for Nevada, you can actually open up um, the species profile in a new tab. So if you do that, it'll take you to a page that looks like this. And the URL up top should reflect the species that you clicked on. So Ovis canadensis is our bighorn sheep. So we know that this is the profile for the bighorn sheep. Um, and you can see there's a number of other different information um, sources on here. So you can look at the top observers of bighorn sheep, all the observations. Um, you can also go up to filter by place and you can type in Nevada and then it'll just change it to only the observations that have been recorded in Nevada. If you scroll down that page, you'll see a really big map that's going to show um, where bighorn sheep have been observed um, throughout North America. So if you zoom in on that to look at Nevada, it'll be pretty messy looking. Um, and all of these different colors refer to different things. So I like to turn off some of the layers that they have. If you go to this map box up here, you can turn off that terrain view and that'll get rid of all these mountains which kind of clog up the screen. If you go to this uh, little layer map thing over here, you can turn off the range view and that'll turn off some of this um, red. So once you do that, you'll have a map that ends up looking like this. This is what my maps are gonna look like today um, because I did get them directly from the iNaturalist website on each of the species profiles. And the different colors are going to refer to different things. So counties that are in green are counties that have a sp that species listed um, as occurring in their county, and they also have iNaturalist observations of that species in the county. Um, whereas these more yellowish kind of orange counties, um, those are the ones that have the species listed um, as being present, but they haven't been observed on iNaturalist yet. Um, and then any blank areas, they are not listed in that county and they have not been observed in that county either. And then each little red individual um, square is going to be an observation that occurred. All right, so for today's program, we are going to be focusing on those habitat and social preferences that are going to be making our animals more elusive in Nevada. So starting off, what is a habitat preference? Well, habitat preferences refer to um, the specific habitats or um, different components of habitats that animals are gonna seek out. And generally, those are gonna be the habitats that they're best adapted to or where they developed. So an extreme example um, in Nevada is the Devil's Hole pupfish, which was forced to develop over the last 10 to 20,000 years um, in a 93 degree spring that's trapped underneath a bunch of rocks. So they ended up trapped in this um, spring that to most other fish is toxic. So being 93 degrees is going to be above the thermal threshold for a lot of fish. Um, and it's also not going to contain a lot of oxygen. And so many species of fish wouldn't be able to survive here, uh, but the devil's hole pupfish can because it is so well adapted after developing in this habitat for thousands of years. And so looking at that habitat, they actually only inhabit the um, first six and a half to seven feet into the spring. So they have a very small habitat that they have adapted to by becoming so small. They're only about an inch in length and they also have really short lifespans. Um, and also since they're living in such a small area um, and since they have a little bit more limited resources, they are not able to have very territorial pop populations. 
So a lot of other pupfish species are going to be more aggressive, but these guys are not going to be, and they're not going to be territorial necessarily either. So another great adaptation or a great example of adaptations and habitats and how they're connected in Nevada is the yucca moth and the yucca plant. Um, so these are two interdependent species, meaning that one cannot survive without the other. Um, so they're both really important and play important roles in each other's life cycles. And they're also considered symbiotic species because um, they are mutually benefiting each other. Um, so how they are benefiting each other is when a female yucca moth is flying around and looking for a place to lay her eggs, she's going to seek out the ovaries of the flowers of the yucca plant. Um, and she has these really cool receptors on her antenna that can sniff out um, if there's already eggs being laid in that ovary. And so if there are, she'll move to a new flower. And as she moves around in between these flowers, she's going to gather up pollen um, with these little antenna type um, tentacle type things near her mouth where she's going to hold that pollen and as she goes to different flowers she's going to deposit it um, to help pollinate the yucca flowers and that's going to keep their population growing. Once she does lay her eggs in the ovary of the flower those eggs will develop into larvae which are going to eat the ovary and then eventually um, whatever products are left over from the flower so seeds or any fruits um, and then eventually they will grow up and become females and repeat the process. So they both serve as, um, in a way, hosts for making sure that the other is going to survive. So if the yucca moth didn't have the flower for their babies to be safely laid in and to eat, they wouldn't survive. And if the yucca flower didn't have the yucca moth to pollinate it, it wouldn't survive either. But a lot of our animals in Nevada that are elusive aren't going to necessarily have such um, strong connections to their specific habitats, though they will have um, still pretty strong connections, just not necessarily to specific species. So some social preferences that we find in our elusive animals are going to be solitary lifestyles as well as territorial lifestyles. And solitary means that um, an animal is going to spend the majority of its life on its own, uh, usually the only time solitary animals um, are going to interact with animals of the same species is when they are going into their breeding season. And so when they're finding a mate and when they're taking care of their babies. Um, and in the case of some reptiles, when they go into hibernation or the reptile form of that is called brumation, um, sometimes they will gather in groups as that's going to provide more thermal protection. And then territorial refers to an animal that's going to defend a certain area that contains resources um, from members of the same species. Those resources can be things like food or water. It can also be things like nesting sites um, and a bunch of different other things too. So an example of a species in Nevada that is solitary but not territorial is the Sonoran lyre snake. Um, so this is a snake that is primarily going to live most of its life alone. Like I said, in the winter when they go into hibernation, they'll sometimes gather in groups or when they're mating, they will. But otherwise, they're gonna spend a lot of their life alone. They don't even raise their babies, so they're not gonna spend time with them either. Um, whereas on the other hand, we have loggerhead shrikes in Nevada. And these are a very aggressive bird that are both solitary and territorial. Um, so the only time they're not going to be solitary is when they're with their mate. Um, so they are going to pair up and actually take care of their chicks together. Usually the female is the one that's going to hang around with the chicks and the male is the more aggressive one that's going to defend the territory. So he'll defend their food source as well as their nesting site um, from other loggerhead shrikes. And just to speak to the aggression in this bird and also give an example of some indirect evidence um, that's pretty cool. Loggerhead shrikes are known for impaling their prey on barbed wire and thorns um, in their areas and that way they can come back to them later and finish feeding. Um, but if you ever see like a tiny lizard impaled on a barbed wire fence, that means you could have a loggerhead shrike in your area. So what are some of the habitat preferences that are found amongst our more elusive wildlife? Well, as we said in the introductory program, forests are a really important resource in Nevada as they are really limited um, and they also are going to be more isolated in the state. 
So we have about 16% um, of our land is made up of forests. And the majority of them are going to have very little species diversity in terms of tree diversity, um, but animal diversity tends to fall um, as tree diversity falls. So the majority of our forests are gonna be dominated by pinyon and juniper, um, but there also are going to be other forests and woodlands in the state as well. Um, the majority that have the most diversity are going to be in the Sierra Nevada ecoregion, so right over here by Lake Tahoe. And then the other more diverse forests are going to be over here closer um, to Great Basin National Park and in kind of White Pine County area. But as you can see from all of these different maps telling us all the different forests and woodlands in Nevada, we have quite a diversity um, of different habitats, but a lot of them are going to be super limited. Um, so the one that's going to be the most common are our lower montane woodlands and chaparral which the difference between woodlands and forests, from my understanding, is just that woodlands tend to have a more open canopy, so more sunlight is going to reach the bottom in those um, habitats, and they're going to be a little bit more open compared to other forests. Um, but you can also see we have aspen woodlands as well as conifer forests. So conifers are going to be forests, or coniferous forests are those that are going to have more pine species or species that aren't going to lose their needles every year. Um, whereas aspen is an example of a deciduous tree species. Um, so those forests are going to have their leaves um, fall every single year. Sagebrush is a, also a really important resource in Nevada. Um, as you can see from the map, it covers a great deal of the state, especially in the Great Basin um, and also in the Northern Plateau ecoregion. But this is going to be a really important resource because it is tied to over 400 different or 350 different plant and animal species that are at risk of extirpation. And extirpation means that um, an animal is kicked out of its natural range. So if we get rid of sagebrush, then we'll also be possibly getting rid of over 350 different kinds of plants and animals. And those are plants and animals that are going to be found um, throughout the Great Basin ecoregion, so not necessarily just in Nevada. Um, but right now, we think the greatest risk to our sagebrush is going to be cheatgrass, which is an invasive species that comes from the Mediterranean region. Um, and it's just, if you look at the map, it is going to be taking over a lot of the area where we see sagebrush. So sagebrush, as we said, was kind of in the central region in Nevada in the northern half whereas the cheatgrass risk is highest in this region as well. And that's going to be a problem for sagebrush because cheatgrass tends to cause really hot wildfires. Um, and those wildfires tend to kill the sagebrush and leave behind um, habitat that's not really good for sagebrush. So then the cheatgrass just comes back and repeats the process and just keeps getting rid of more and more sagebrush. And like we said, that's not a good thing um, because the sagebrush community is going to support over 350 different kinds of animals. Um, and just in Nevada, we have 13 different sagebrush obligate species. Um, those are species that rely on sagebrush. And if we don't have any, we're not gonna have those species either. So another resource um, that's pretty limited in Nevada are our, our alpine habitats which are going to be find, found at higher elevations, usually above 9,000 and 10,000 feet. Um, and they're typically going to have much cooler temperatures, um, especially in the winter. In the summer, they're still going to be cooler compared to in our valleys and our basins, um, but they're also going to have higher winds in the summer and a little bit more limited um, plant species. But these habitats are also disappearing in Nevada. Um, they're already pretty limited because not a lot of our mountain ranges get up to that um, high in elevation. So usually you're going to find these habitats near the Ruby Mountains, kind of near Great Basin National Park. Um, and then there's some hidden out in the middle, as well as near the Sierra Nevada ecoregion. So the next resource um, are our aquatic resources, which are going to be um, different types of aquatic habitats, and there's a bunch of different kinds in the state of Nevada. So wetlands and riparian zones are some of the most important um, aquatic habitats here, 
Riparian zones are going to be the lands that are right next to water sources and they tend to have um, a lot of trees which are going to provide cover in addition to nesting sites and then um, food that there's going to come in the form of seeds and other things. Um, we're also going to have wetlands which are areas that are going to periodically flood and they're going to hold and store water. Um, so they're good in that they can recharge our underground aquifers and help mitigate future floods, um, but they also provide habitat for over 400 species of breeding birds. Um, so wetlands and riparian zones are super important habitats in Nevada, in addition to all these others like our rivers, streams, lakes, and all these other different kinds. As you can see though, a lot of our water is going to be concentrated in different regions. So a lot of our rivers and streams are gonna be in the northern half of the state. Our lakes and reservoirs are pretty limited, though we do have Lake Mead down here in the southern half of the state. Um, and especially our springs and springs brooks. Those are gonna be the ones that are going to be found throughout the state. Um, and they tend to have some unique species that come with it, including those devil's hole pupfish, which are gonna be down here near Ash Meadows National Wildlife Refuge. So getting into some of their adaptations, our forest species tend to be very agile. So a lot of them have a bunch of different ways to get around and they can get around very quickly. Um, they also are going to have a lot of different diet options, though that is going to depend on the type of forest, because as we said, forests that have limited tree species, they tend to provide less options in terms of food. Um, and then a lot of forest species are gonna go into hibernation and migration. Um, and that's partially because a lot of our forests are gonna be at those higher elevations. Um, so they're gonna get a little bit cooler in the fall and winter months. So speaking to their agility, we have species like flammulated owls, um, which are going to be flying around at night. So being an aerial predator is going to be super beneficial in that you can hide away up in the sky or in the branches and that way your prey can't see you. But also that means humans can't see you. So that's gonna make it harder for us. Uh, we also have flying squirrels in Nevada. They're concentrated in the Sierra Nevada eco region. They are not capable of true flight. The only mammal that is um, are bats but flying squirrels are gonna use this membrane that's between their feet, um, and they're gonna use that to glide through the canopy um, at nighttime, which is also gonna be beneficial for them as they can avoid those predators that are gonna be on the ground, though they'll still have to deal with things like the flammulated owl, um, but they're also gonna avoid things like us as well. We also have gray fox in Nevada. Um, a lot of people think that foxes are just going to be running on, around on the ground like coyotes, but gray fox can actually climb. So they have these really impressive claws um, and that's going to enable them to climb up into trees as well as these cactus that these two got up into. Um, and that's going to be really beneficial for them because that's going to give them access to more resources. So if they were just eating things on the ground, they might be focused on small mammals and maybe some lizards running around down there. But if they climb up into the trees, they might be able to find some bird nests where they can eat some eggs um, and maybe some other resources, even just the adult birds as well. You can also maybe just find a nice spot to take a nap as well. So that'll be a nice cozy spot that'll keep you away from humans and other predators and stressors that are out there. This is an example of a really excellent climber. So this is the American Martin, and it's also concentrated in the Sierra Nevada ecoregion um, of Nevada. You can see they got those really big paws and claws, which are gonna be really characteristic of our climbing species. So not necessarily all forest species, but just climbers in general. Even if you're a rock climber, you're gonna have, you're gonna tend to have bigger claws. Um, but they're also going to have these really flexible toes, so you can see they're gripping that branch to help hold themselves up. And then they have those really cool rotatable feet. Um, they can rotate their feet 180 degrees so that they can climb down things face first, um, which is really cool. And then in terms of diets, so some of our animals are going to specialize on different things. Um, so pinion jays are going to prefer to eat seeds that are going to be on the ground. 
Um, so one of the benefits of this is since they're going to be gathering in groups at this point, um, that's going to make it a lot easier to find them as flocks of birds um, tend to be easier to see, but they're also going to be more noisy usually. Um, and a lot of times people expect to look for birds just when they're perching up um, kind of in plain sight, and that's not always going to be the case depending on that animal's habit. So if they're going to be a species that's feeding on the ground on seeds like the pinion jays, you're going to have to uh, change the way you're looking for that type of wildlife. This is a sooty grouse, which is normally going to be found in forests that have a lot more cover, especially closer to the ground, um, as that's going to help them camouflage with their concealing coloration. But their diet is going to focus um, more in open areas, so they'll go out to areas with more flowers, um, and more green kind of grasses, um, and that's where they're primarily going to be feeding. So it's going to be a lot harder to find them when they're concealed deep in the forest cover compa compared to when they're out at feeding sites, um, which may be more in the open. And then we also have our raptors in our forest as well as other carnivores. Um, so carnivores are animals that are going to eat meat, and raptors are a specific type of bird that is a carnivore. Um, so this is a northern goshawk, and it's going to be one of the main aerial predators in some of our forests. Um, you can see it's got quite a few different adaptations. It's got really good eyesight that's going to help it um, to maneuver and find prey in its forest habitat. That long rudder-like tail is also going to help it to maneuver through the branches um, and things like that. So with these guys, it's probably best time to see them when they're out on their perch, as they tend to um, hang out like that. It's typical of predators that are going to be flying in from above and going down to get their prey. So that would probably be the best time to see them is when they're perching. Other birds might be different depending on their behaviors. We also have ornate tree lizards, um, which are going to live in our woodlands and some kind of forested areas. Um, but when it gets too cold and too hot, they are going to become inactive. So when it's cold, they'll go into their reptile form of hibernation, which is called brumation. Um, I'll explain that further in the next program, which is going to focus on activity patterns. Um, and then they're also going to go into a form, not necessarily of hibernation, but it's called estivation, and it's when they get too hot, um, they can become inactive as well. On the right side, I have a hoary bat, which is a solitary species that lives in forests. Um, and it is typically going to shelter underneath um, the shaggy bark of trees. Um, in the winter, when it gets cold, this species is not going to hibernate. A lot of times we think that bats do. Um, but this bat is just going to migrate to a warmer place um, and still remain pretty solitary throughout the rest of the year. So the representative forest species I wanted to highlight was the North American porcupine, and it has seven iNaturalist observations in Nevada. And I chose this species because for a long time I didn't even realize that there were North American porcupines in Nevada. Um, but you can see from the map they have been observed around the Ruby Mountains area near Elko, um, kind of around Great Basin National Park, but all of these counties have the North American porcupine listed as a species that occurs there. So they can be found throughout the state. You just have to look for that specific habitat that they prefer, which also is going to be around that Sierra Nevada eco region. Um, but you can see from this seasonality chart that most of the observations that occurred in Nevada happened um, around May and in July, but mostly in these warmer months right here. Um, porcupine are not going to hibernate. They're going to remain active throughout the year, though their activity is going to become pretty limited during the winter months. So our porcupine, as we know, are going to be a forest associated species, um, and they like quite a few different types of forests. So they are going to prefer forests in Nevada that can have both conifers and deciduous trees. So again, conifers, things like pines, um, which specifically they like ponderosa and Jeffrey pines. Um, and then our more deciduous species they're going to prefer are aspen, cottonwoods, um, and also willow trees. Um, and one of the reasons why they're so dependent on forest is because trees are going to provide their main food source. So as you can see on this pine tree right here, 
the bark has been scraped off and actually chewed off, chewed off by the porcupine as the inner cambium layer just underneath the bark, that's where the tree is still growing. That's what the porcupine likes to eat. So you can see on this porcupine right here, they've got those characteristic um, orange teeth, which is found throughout rodents. Um, and that's a layer of iron that grows on the outside that enables their teeth to be strong enough to chew on these coarse woody uh, surfaces. In order for them to climb, they also have this really cool adaptation. They have this kind of pebbly texture on the bottom of their feet, um, and that's going to help them get a better grip as they're climbing up the trees that they like to climb. They're also going to have those big claws like that American Martin that's going to help them get a better grip as well. And as you can see, being up in the trees is some of the best and safest spots for porcupines. So they camouflage pretty well up there. Um, so when you're out, if you're ever looking for porcupine, um, more than likely you're not going to see them on the ground. You need to be looking up in order to find them. So take a couple seconds here. I wasn't able to set up any polls for this program. But take a few seconds and see if you can identify where the porcupine is in the picture. So he is right there in the center. Um, but as you can see throughout all these different wooded habitats, the porcupines are going to blend in quite a bit. Um, they can have some color variation and that's mostly going to depend on the type of habitat they live in. Um, but in general, in Nevada, most of them are going to be more brown in color and a little darker. Um, so porcupine are also able to swim, which is not something um, that a lot of people know, but forest habitats have a lot of plant life, so they tend to be closer to water sources. Um, and so porcupines have been able to take advantage of that and use that as a way to get around in addition to climbing up trees. Um, because porcupines, when they are on the ground, they are very awkward because their body has been built to be really low and stout and able to climb up the trees. Um, they're going to look a little bit awkward as they're walking around, as you can see from this video. Um, and also, they act like they have an attitude they really don't care. And that's because of those quills that they have. So they have these really big quills that are about three to four inches long. And they're actually just really stiff hairs that have hundreds of tiny little barbs at the very end of them. Um, and the reason why the porcupine can just kind of mosey through that field and is acting like he doesn't care is because they have this great um, self-defense and protection in the form of these quills. So as soon as a predator comes up and touches the tip of that quill, one of one or more of those barbs can embed um, in the predator's skin. And when it pulls away, it's gonna pull that barb out and stick with the predator, um, which is totally fine for the porcupine. Their quills do grow back. Um, and then also a fun fact I learned was um, if porcupines ever accidentally stab themselves with their quills, which is apparently common given that they are very clumsy um, and sometimes they fall out of trees, um, the base of their quills have an antibacterial type um, property that actually will help them to heal. So the predators are not going to get that antibacterial property though. So some signs you can look for, like I said, sometimes porcupines are clumsy, so they might leave their quills around, maybe in trees or on the ground if they fell out of a tree. Um, you can also look for their tracks. So especially if it's on a wetter substrate, um, you can get that little pebbly pattern that they have on the bottom of their pads, and that's really distinct and will be a really good um, identification for the porcupine in that area. Um, as we said earlier, they're going to be chewing on trees, just kind of getting that um, outer bark layer off so that they can chew the inner cambium layer that's living. Um, so they're going to leave these kind of chew marks along trees. Um, sometimes people think they might be confused with beaver chews, but beavers are typically going to girdle trees, so they're going to bring them in on the sides, whereas porcupines are just taking um, the bark, they're just stripping parts of the bark. So despite the fact that all of those um, Nevada iNaturalist observations occurred during the summer months, um, I found some different indirect evidence that you can look for that might be able, that you might be able to find during the winter. So in the winter, they're going to leave these really cool tracks that are going to have this kind of zigzagging pattern, and that's partially because of their tail. 
Um, they're also going to be denning up in the winter. So they're not going to be hibernating, but they are going to have these winter dens that are going to provide more thermal protection for them. And so if you can find one of these dens, um, that can be good evidence of them. I've heard that porcupines are pretty stinky. So if you find a stinky hole in the ground that's big enough to fit a 20 pound porcupine, uh, that would be a good bet that that's a porcupine den. Also, like we said, their coloration, um, it helps them to blend in with their forests in the summertime. Um, being dark helps them blend in with the trees and with the grass and with all the darker shades that are being um, created from all the canopy cover. But during the winter time, when there's snow out, that brown is gonna stick out really, really well. Um, so even though they're not gonna be as active in the winter, you might be able to spot them a little bit more easily when they are out, just because they're gonna stand out compared to the landscape more. Um, in the winter, they might also be easier to find just because in the fall and winter time, when our trees, our deciduous trees leave, lose their leaves, um, then you're just gonna be able to find this big ball up there in the tree and hopefully you can find out if that's a porcupine. Um, but like iNaturalist um, showed us, the majority of the observations occur during the summer and that's going to be um, when they are finding mates and also when they are raising their young. Um, and so another great form of indirect evidence um, for porcupine is actually the calls they have. So a lot of people don't realize that porcupines can make quite a bit of vocalizations. Um, and they're going to be more vocal generally during the spring and summertime when they're going to be more social because most of the time they're going to be solitary. So here is a little clip of what porcupines sound like. So as you can hear, they can get pretty loud. Um, so yeah, maybe if you hear that ever out, that could be a porcupine. So our sagebrush species adaptations, they're going to be a little bit different than our um, forest species, though some of them will be similar. So a lot of our sagebrush species live in these habitats that where the sagebrush don't get super tall, so they're primarily going to be ground dwelling species. Um, and that's just going to help keep them more concealed in that habitat. They're also going to be small in size for the same reason. Um, if you're bigger than all the surrounding brushes that are going to be protecting you, then you're likely going to get spotted by a predator and eaten. And then also we have a number of sagebrush obligate species that are going to be quite agile, um, but in different ways from our forest species. So an example of a ground dwelling sagebrush species are sagebrush or are brewers sparrows. And these are going to be sparrows that are going to hang out on the ground hunting for little bugs and also different plant products. Um, so during the year when it gets colder and those bugs disappear, they're also going to become more inactive, so they'll become even harder to find. Um, but generally, ground dwelling birds are going to be harder to find because most of the time people assume um, birds are going to be perching and that's going to be the best time to see them, but that's not the case for all birds. There's also sagebrush voles, which are burrowing species, so they don't stay above the ground, they actually go underground, which provides even more thermal and predator protection from them, or for them, but it also makes it harder for us to view them. Um, and especially since they're actually going to be active primarily at nighttime as well, that's going to make it even harder. There's also sagebrush lizards are considered a sagebrush obligate species in Nevada. Um, and they are going to be primarily eating the bugs that are living in and around the sagebrush communities. Um, but just like our other lizards, um, given that sagebrush tends to be in the Great Basin ecoregion, which gets colder winters, uh, these lizards are going to become inactive during those colder times during the year. We also have pygmy rabbits. These are the smallest species of rabbit in North America. Um, so they're really, really tiny, um, they're super cute, and they're going to have a lot of that concealing coloration that's going to help them blend in with all this kind of um, plants and different branches and sagebrush debris that's going to be on the ground in those sagebrush communities, um, which 
So the sagebrush lizard and we said the brewer sparrow are primarily going to be eating the bugs out in the sagebrush ecosystem, whereas pygmy rabbits a lot around along with a lot of the other obligate species are going to be primarily eating the sagebrush. So actually 98% of their diet is sagebrush. So even more important reason to conserve the plant um, because those species that rely on it as a food source are definitely not going to survive without it. So getting more into agility, pronghorn antelope are also considered a sagebrush obligate species in Nevada and they are actually the second fastest land mammal um, on earth. So they have developed um, on our landscape for thousands of years and at one point um, their main predator was something that was like a cheetah so it was really really fast. We no longer have that predator but we still have the pronghorn and they retain that um, insane amount of speed and all the different adaptations that help them to get up to those um, really high speeds. I believe they can get up to about 60 to 70 miles per hour which is going to be really helpful when you are evading predators in the sagebrush um, ecosystem. So sagebrush tends to occur in more flat areas so that's going to be a lot better for runners whereas the climbing species in the forests are not going to necessarily have as much um, tall plants to climb up to hide, so they wouldn't fare as well, just like the sagebrush species wouldn't fare as well as those forest, in those forest ecosystems for similar reasons. Um, the last sagebrush obligate I'll talk about is the sage thrasher, which is the smallest species of thrasher. Um, and they have these really long legs that are gonna help them to run along on the ground, which is primarily what they're going to be doing. So like the brewer sparrow, they're going to be running around on the ground eating bugs and other little things down there. Uh, most of the time they don't come up to perch, though that sometimes is going to be the best time to catch them if you get a rare glimpse of one perching up on the sagebrush. Um, otherwise they're going to be a really elusive species since they're on the ground most of the time. So the sagebrush obligate species I wanted to highlight is the greater sage grouse um, and that's because it is considered an umbrella species in the sagebrush community, meaning that by um, conserving their habitat in the sagebrush community, you're also going to be conserving all these other different habitats or sub habitats within sagebrush that the other sagebrush obligates rely on. So they are a really cool bird, but they're actually the largest species of grouse um, in the US and they're also the most common species of grouse in Nevada, but they still only have 26 iNaturalist observations. So I figured I'd put them on here. Um, but as you can see, they can be found throughout the state. Almost all of our counties have them listed um, as a species that is present, though the majority of their um, observations are going to be around the Ruby Mountains, Toyabe Dome Wilderness, and then also up in like Sheldon Wildlife Refuge. Um, you can see from their seasonality map that these observations were primarily occurring during the warmer months, which is when they are going to be going into their breeding season and going to Lex, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So that's definitely going to be the best time um, to view the sage grouse, very similar to other species. Um, summertime breeding time is the best time to go find them. So sage grouse can be more um, elusive though because they are really well camouflaged to their sagebrush habitat. So you can see right here they've got that concealing coloration that's helping them um, to blend in with the sagebrush. They also are already pretty low to the ground. They're ground dwelling birds um, and smaller in size, at least the females are. So they're going to hide pretty well. Um, but they also do this thing kind of like the pygmy rabbit um, and a lot of sagebrush species where when they feel threatened, they instead of flying away or running away right away, they're going to kind of hunker down and make themselves even smaller um, in an attempt to blend in even more with their habitat. But if that doesn't work, um, they can be flushed and they will fly up in the air. Um, and it's really cool because sage grouse, when they take off in flight, they can take off um, and achieve f speeds of 50 miles per hour pretty quickly. So they can fly really fast and get away pretty easily, but they can't sustain that flight for long. They are a bigger, heavier bird, so they are eventually going to land. And so you can see the male and the female here. So the male's quite a bit bigger than the female. Uh, the female is more similar in size to our chickens. The male is gonna be much, well, not much bigger, but he's gonna be bigger. 
And the best time to see them is going to be when they are in their breeding season. So this is going to be what a lek is. It's an area that um, is flatter and it has less uh, tall brush in the middle. It's surrounded by sagebrush. Um, and that way all the birds can head on to the middle uh, where the males will do their displays, which they're going to be using these yellow air sacs that are in their chests. Um, they're going to be blowing those up and making these really weird noises that's going to attract the females. And um, they also have these spiky plume feathers on their tail feathers, and that's going to help them um, not only with camouflaging, but also with impressing um, the girls. And then they have this really bright yellow comb over their eyes, so that can help um, with identification if you're able to find them in the field. So to show you uh, some of how they're going to act during the lex, and then also um, the noises they make. Here's a little video. I don't think that was a successful attempt. So that is how the sage grouse are going to be mating and that is likely going to be the best time to go and see them is during the spring and summer months when they're going to be out at those leks. So some alpine species adaptations. So we said alpine habitats tend to be um, above eight or nine or ten thousand feet in elevation. Um, so the animals that are going to live up there are going to be more temperature sensitive, especially to higher temperatures. They're more adapted to living in those cooler environments, so they're not going to do well, especially if the summer is really, really hot. Um, they're going to have limited activities, not only because of the hot weather, but also um, in the winter, it's going to get even colder up in our alpine habitats and there's going to be more snow accumulation. So they're definitely going to have more limited, ac limited activities during that time as well. Um, and then a lot of them are going to engage in habits like food caching and creating hardy shelters. So food caching is when an animal stores food for winter. Um, and then hardy shelters are just anything that's going to protect them from the high winds, the snow, and also the high heat that can sometimes be in those alpine habitats. And in general, it's not high heat for us, but for them it is. So rufous hummingbirds are an example um, of a species that's going to only use alpine habitats when it's migrating through Nevada. So hummingbirds are a type of species that are not going to be able to thermoregulate really well in super cold or super hot environments. Um, so alpine environments they're going to use just when they are passing through. And that's going to be when there's going to be the most food availability. Um, and it's going to have better temperatures for them. So they're not going to be up in our alpine habitats in the middle of winter. They would not survive as they're going to be looking for those flowers um, and other flowering plants that are going to be up there more so in the summertime. We also have rubber boas, which are an alpine adapted snake species, which is not super common, um, but they can be found at elevations above 10,000 feet. Um, and they are really cool because they can remain active even in temperatures as cold as 44 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that also is not very common among snakes. Um, though on the opposite end, they do become um, inactive if they get too hot as well. And when that happens, they tend to like to burrow. Um, so they'll hide underneath the sand or whatever gravel is in their area, maybe even in rock crevices, and that's going to make them harder to find because usually we're going to be out in these alpine habitats during the day if you're hiking or doing anything like that. Black rosy finches um, are also a species that are going to have some of their activities limited um, given that they live in alpine habitats. So they like to eat insects during the spring and summer. Um, but those are going to go away quickly during the fall and winter. Um, the insects are going to provide a lot more energy for these birds than some of the food that they're going to supplement it with during the winter. And so they're going to remain less active during this time, during the winter time, just to conserve their energy um, and wait until that really good food source returns. There are also dusky shrews, which are these tiny little 
fuzzy wuzzy things that live up in our alpine habitats. Um, and they are also going to be active year round. So in the summer and spring, they also like to eat insects. Um, and in the colder months, they're gonna rely more so on plant material. Um, but instead of maybe burrowing into the ground like the rubber boa, they're just gonna hide in dead and decaying logs or even snags, which are just um, dead standing trees. So they'll hide out in those places. Whereas things like the black rosy finches, they're gonna seek out more like rocky outcrops for thermal protection. And then we also have digging species like our montane vole and montane pocket gopher. Um, so our montane vole is a species and also our montane pocket gopher that are going to be active throughout the year despite living in these cold environments. Um, and so for them to stay active throughout the year, they're gonna have to save up a food supply. So they're going to be engaging in that food caching um, where they are going out and gathering different plant materials that are no longer going to be available during the winter. Um, they're also, as you can see, they're pretty small. And the montane pocket gopher is also really important because a lot of other animals are really lazy and so they end up stealing um, their little gopher holes. Um, so they actually provide even more habitat to other animals as well. So they can make other animals more elusive in addition to themselves. So the alpine representative I have for today is the American pika, which is a super cute small little animal that is related to rabbits. So it is not a rodent um, and it is actually the inspiration for Pikachu. So these guys have been observed 11 times um, on iNaturalist in Nevada, primarily in the Ruby Mountains and then also kind of near Mount Rose and the Sierra Nevada ecoregion. Um, and they're only going to be found during the warmer months of the year and that's going to be their winter preparation time because the rest of the year they're going to be um, hidden out in their rock crevices and they're not going to be going out very often. They're not gonna be hibernating, um, but they're still going to be active. So they need to prep um, during the summer months. And so one of the ways they do that is they're gonna hide out during the hottest parts of the day underneath their rock crevices. And then when opportunities arise, they'll run out and grab a bunch of different vegetation and bring it back to um, their dens. And so one of their better um, examples of indirect evidence are their hay piles. That's what they're called. Um, they leave out these plants to dry just outside their rock crevices and then they bring them on in and kind of line the rocks and the walls with it. That way there's more thermal protection during the winter. And then they'll also eat some of it too. So um, different hay piles they're gonna eat. Um, and then there'll be different hay piles for the ones that are just going to be materials for their dens. But if you take a couple seconds, once again, try to find the pica in this picture. So it is smack dab in the middle pretty much, so similar to that porcupine. Um, but as you can see, um, these tiny little uh, creatures are really well camouflaged to that rocky kind of background that they're used to. Um, and they're really small, so they are about twice the size of hamsters. Um, so they're gonna be really hard to find up in those alpine habitats, especially with all those big rocks, and then there's some little rocks around too. So some of the best observations you can get from pika are likely from their indirect evidence. Um, but if you look in this picture, um, their tracks show up really well in the snow because otherwise um, they live in those habitats that have more kind of boulders and rocks that it's not good substrate for leaving tracks. Um, but snow is, although I don't really want to go hiking up into an alpine habitat when it's cold and snowy. So if you are brave enough to do that, that may be your best bet in terms of finding pika tracks. Um, you can also find their little poops, which are going to look like uh, rabbit poops since they're related to rabbits. Um, if you're not good at identifying tracks or scat, you can actually upload these pictures to iNaturalist and people can still help you to identify them and that still counts as an observation um, since you did find direct evidence or indirect evidence that that animal was there. So um, the summertime we said was one of the better times to look for them because they're going to be out looking, um, trying to get all these plants to gather, um, get winter. 
Um, but it's also going to be their breeding season and it's also going to be when they're going to be the most vocal. So similar to our porcupines, um, pikas are going to make noises that are used to communicate when um, they are guarding their territories or also when they are um, communicating with other pika looking for mates and stuff. So here is a video to show you that. So they're really, really cute. And if you can hear that squeak, then that just might be enough evidence um, that there is a pika in the area and that would be really cool. So now moving on to our aquatic species. Um, many of our aquatic species are gonna have specific water preferences. So both in terms of the type of water. So like if it's a spring versus a river versus a pond and also in terms of the water quality. So some of our animals are able to live in water that's more polluted. Some animals refuse to live in polluted water and are gonna live in only really clean water sources, which since lots of our water sources in Nevada are near um, human development, uh, clean water sources are not the easiest to find. Um, a lot of our aquatic species are also gonna be really well camouflaged to their aquatic environments, which since aquatic environments are so different from others, their camouflage is going to be a little bit different. Um, and they're also going to have a number of other physical traits like the webbing between their toes or flippers that's gonna help them out um, with getting around and staying concealed. And then a lot of our aquatic species are also going to migrate or hibernate. Um, and that's because when the water freezes, some of them are not able to utilize that habitat anymore. So they're gonna go into hibernation or they're just gonna leave the area and come back when um, the habitat is better equipped for them. So an example of an aquatic species in Nevada are our river otters, and they are going to prefer larger bodies of water. So like their name suggests rivers, but also things um, like lakes. And then they'll also use um, these kind of little channels that go into wetlands, especially those that lead to beaver ponds, as those are really good stopover sites for them. So stopover sites are areas that generally are gonna provide more food and cover and shelter for animals. Um, so river otters are going to hang out around beaver ponds a lot of the times, but they're going to be seen um, throughout the rivers or whatever water source they're in. They tend to travel throughout the day and throughout the year, um, and they're mainly just looking for new food sources. So they don't like to stay in one spot and risk um, running out of food is the main reason. And so they'll also leave dens um, at the areas where they do stop over. So that's some good indirect evidence of them. Um, but river otters are one of our elusive species that is actually going to be more social. So when they have um, babies, they're going to remain with their families for a little while. Um, I believe it's at least a year. And so that's going to make it a lot easier to find them because groups of animals are going to stand out more than just an individual animal. Um, and then part of the reason why river otters are going to be preferring larger bodies of water as well as cleaner bodies of water is because of the prey they eat. So they're going to be eating fish and crayfish and frogs and all the little um, things that are going to be living in these aquatic habitats. So if that water that they're living in is dirty, they're going to get dirty and the river otter is going to eat all of them and eventually get sick. So they are going to prefer really clean water sources. I know within Nevada, um, there are records in the Humboldt, Carson, um, and Truckee rivers, and even just within the last two years, I've seen um, a pair of river otters come back to Oxbow Nature Study Area in Reno a couple different times. And I'll be covering river otters um, again in another later program. Um, another species that's going to be associated with beaver ponds are Columbia spotted frogs. Um, so these are smaller frogs that are going to be hiding out generally underneath the aquatic vegetation that floats on top of the ponds that they choose. Um, so that aquatic vegetation like this duckweed right here, that's going to provide a lot of cover for them, um, both the adults as well as their tadpoles. Um, and that's another reason uh, why they prefer beaver ponds and more still water um, is the tadpole. So still water is going to make them a lot less stressed and then 
still water is also going to get a lot warmer, though it's not going to get super hot, and that's going to be more comfortable for the tadpoles as well. Um, but like all other um, amphibian species in Nevada, um, they are going to be an aquatic um, species because part of their life cycle takes part in water. So when they are tadpoles, they have gills, they're breathing underwater, they have a tail fin that's going to help them to get around, and eventually they'll develop into adults where they'll have those lungs and they'll have their legs, those really powerful back legs, especially for jumping and getting away. And then the last water species I'm going to talk about is the common loon, which is going to be a species that is only going to be in Nevada while it migrates through. Um, so that's going to be pretty common amongst different bird species. Um, they're only going to be in Nevada during certain parts of the year. So loons are going to migrate through and generally when they stop, they stop at different lakes. Um, like our river otters though, they are predatory. So they are going to prefer clean lakes. And they are really well adapted to this aquatic lifestyle. So looking at this loon that's trying to take off, you can't even see its legs because they're so far back on its body. Um, and that's beneficial for birds that are going to be swimming, especially birds that are going to be diving. Um, and so loons are also really cool because they have solid bones. So most of our other birds in the world are going to have hollow bones. They have these tiny little holes in them and that makes them more lightweight. So it's easier for them to fly. But loons want to be heavier so that they can dive and they can dive faster. Um, so they are actually going to have a solid skeletal uh, skeleton compared to other birds. And then they're also going to have this unique oil that they're going to rub over their feathers that's going to make them more aerodynamic. Um, but this aquatic lifestyle does have its drawbacks. So because their legs are so far back on their body, they actually can't really get up on land. Um, I believe slopes over 30 degrees, they can't walk up. Um, so they are extremely limited to their aquatic um, environments and those specific um, aquatic environments to the really clean lakes that they like. So then our aquatic uh, representative species is going to be the monobasin mountain beaver, which is so elusive it has zero iNaturalist observations in Nevada. But based on the 2013 Nevada Department of Wildlife Wildlife Action Plan, um, we know from research that there is a population of mountain beavers that lives in the Mono Basin within the Ta Tahoe Basin um, in the Sierra Nevada ecoregion. Um, so since there's no iNaturalist observations in Nevada, this is a seasonality graph for all of the uh, mountain, beaver at a, mountain beaver observations that have ever occurred. Um, which is in total 74. So they do occur in California as well as Washington and Oregon. So that tells you how elusive they are is they only have 74 throughout all of these different states that they are found in. Um, and primarily the reason for that is because they have super specific habitat requirements. Um, so mountain beavers are actually going to be one of the most primitive species of rodents, if not the most primitive species um, in the world, because they haven't developed much in the past 40 million years. Um, and because of that, they are not able to process their urine correctly, so they have really archaic kidneys, um, and they also aren't able to thermoregulate very well, so they can't handle hot temperatures. Um, they also can't handle really cold temperatures either. So they're going to live in the Sierra Nevada ecoregion of Nevada, where there is going to be um, a lot more water sources that are constant water sources, so they're not going to disappear. And then it's also going to have a lot more of this succulent and green vegetation, which is also a water source for the mountain beaver. And so they need these habitats because, um, like I said, their kidneys are not going to process their urine correctly. So as soon as they urinate, they have to replenish all of that water they just lost. So every day they have to drink about a third of their weight um, in water in order to survive. So another thing that's going to make them more elusive is that they do live underground. So they are a fossorial species, meaning that they burrow. Um, and mountain beavers are actually going to create really extensive burrows. We have found burrows that are um, over 10 feet underground, and they're going to have multiple different chambers, including places for them to 
go to the toilet, um, an area for them to sleep, as well as areas that are going to have different um, food stored there. Um, and these burrows are really cool, not only because they have all these different parts, um, but they also, the mountain beaver will line them with vegetation um, so that it maintains a constant level of humidity and temperature throughout the entirety of the year. So they always have this little underground shelter that is there to protect them. Um, and that's going to be able to be made more easily in the Sierra Nevada ecoregion because it has more moist soils. Um, and then also, like we said, it has that succulent vegetation and more of that constant water source. So one of the best um, indirect evidences of our mountain beavers are going to be their little burrows, um, which mountain beavers are going to be about twice the length of the guinea pig of a guinea pig and about the same in weight. Um, so if you can imagine that size, their burrows are not going to be super big, um, but they will usually be around like the base of trees. Um, and sometimes they'll have this vegetation around it um, that they'll eventually either bring in to store for food or maybe just to help line their burrow. Um, but you can see in this picture on the right, the mountain beaver is really well adapted to living this underground lifestyle. It's got these big claws and big paws to help it um, to burrow and dig. It also has these really big long whiskers that are going to help it to feel around and sense different things it's in its environment, given that it's got these tiny eyes and ears that are not going to be its primary senses that it's using, especially if it's underground most of the time. And those weird little feet are going to make these really distinct um, kind of tracks. And given that they live in a moister environment, um, it's likely they're going to leave more distinct tracks in the mud or whatever moist soil is there. Um, so definitely if you ever find creepy, long, skinny hands like this, um, I would upload that to iNaturalist and check to see if that is a mountain beaver because that is a super cool find. Um, but they also, since they live in forests, they are capable of climbing, though they cannot climb super high like the marten or anything like that. Um, so generally, given that they are so small, they're going to prefer to hang out around seedlings. Um, those are very small trees that were just planted and have only developed a little bit. Um, so those are the trees that the mountain beaver are generally going to be hanging out around, and those are the ones that they like to eat. So similar to our porcupine, they like to eat that inner um, layer just underneath the bark. Um, but then they are also, excuse me, <coughs> But that is also how they got their name. So when California miners came through Nevada and found mountain beavers, they saw them chewing on these little tiny uh, seedlings and they assumed then that they were related to the North American beaver, which actually they are not. They are more closely related to squirrels. Um, so that is going to be their closest relative. They don't have very many adaptations that are similar to the North American beaver. Um, even though both are dependent on these kind of aquatic ecosystems. And so looking at the other iNaturalist observations um, that were from different states, it seems like unless you're a researcher, um, coming across a mountain beaver is pretty random. It looked like a lot of them was just uh, mountain beavers that had wandered into people's gardens or maybe had been crossing a trail or a road while someone was driving past. Um, so they're going to be harder to find just in terms of if you want to actually observe the animal itself. Um, so your best bet is to look for that indirect evidence. Um, so looking at these different chewings, different animals are going to leave different chew patterns dependent on the, their teeth structure. Um, so mountain beavers are going to have a little bit different a chew pattern than say a squirrel and that's going to be different than say a rabbit, especially since rabbits have double incisors that are going to have a very distinct cut pattern. But you can also upload these to iNaturalist if you don't know how to identify them and people can help you with that. Um, also looking for those burrows like I said. Um, so they're about twice the length of the guinea pig, but they're going to be about the same weight. So using your hand, that's a generally a good kind of size for um, comparison in terms of the mountain beavers burrows. Um, another thing I noticed on the iNaturalist observations was that a lot of mountain beaver burrows had these kind of dirt driveways that led up to them. I um, mean, a lot of them also have kind of dried vegetation around them or just vegetation that's been stomped down. Um, so that can also be some other indirect evidence that might get you a closer look at them. 
Um, but since you're not likely to see them, which is really unfortunate, um, I'm going to play a little video just so you can see how cute this guy is. So as you can see, they're really small and cute. Um, they've got kind of that grizzly fur on them that's going to provide them with more thermal protection given that they're not really good at thermoregulating. So they are actually similar to pica in that um, if they go out in certain temperatures, for pica it's temperatures above 78 degrees Fahrenheit, um, they can enter heat stress where they'll just kind of like pass out and that's obviously not um, a good spot to be in. It's very vulnerable to predators. So now the last animal I'm going to talk about is the desert night lizard. Um, and the reason why I wanted to focus on this species is because a lot of the species that were highlighted in this program um, were more so solitary. And desert night lizards are actually going to be, um, they're gonna be in family groups year round, which is super rare amongst lizards. It's actually, they are one of about 20 different species that engage in having family groups in this type of social structure. And so in Nevada, they're only going to be found in the southern portion of the state, especially near kind of like um, Red Rock National Conservation Area. Um, and they're mostly going to be found during these warmer months, like um, a lot of our elusive species, that's when they're going to be most active. Um, but contrary to the name, um, night lizards are actually going to be primarily diurnal. Um, they are going to be more so crepuscular or active at nighttime or twilight when um, it gets to be really, really hot during the summer um, as they're not going to be able to thermoregulate as well. So that's when they're going to retreat to their um, kind of woody debris cover, which to get a look at their habitat. So this is a good example. Um, they tend to prefer habitats that are going to have a lot of woody debris and cover on the bottom. So they like areas that have Joshua trees and prickly pears um, and pinion juniper that eventually when they die, leave all this litter on the ground. That's really great stuff to hide in for them. Um, they also like rocks as well though. But you can see they blend in really well to this environment and they're primarily going to be crawling around on the ground, though sometimes they can be up on rocks or logs basking. Um, but in general, these lizards are pretty sedentary, so they don't move around a whole lot. Um, and they are going to primarily be um, in their shelters throughout most of their lives. So they don't come out a whole lot. Um, though when they do, since they are primarily diurnal, it can be easier to spot them since they come out during the daytime when we're usually out looking for them. But it's really cool that they are going to live in these family groups because that kind of social setting is going to provide a lot more protection from predators than if you were just an individ individual animal all on your own. Um, and especially for these guys, when they are born, they're only about the size of a toothpick. So you would think that they would be very vulnerable, um, but even though they stay in their family groups, their parents and their siblings do not help take care of them at all. They are independent from their birth, um, and we're not exactly sure why that is. Some think that it's because um, desert night lizards are a live bearing lizard. So that means that they actually give live birth, which is in a way kind of different. So their egg is going to develop inside of the mother and then it's also going to hatch inside of the mother. Um, and doing this is going to provide more protection. So generally the baby develop, it's going to develop more. Um, so when it's born, they're a little bit more independent. So that can partially be um, the reason why the parents don't necessarily spend much time with them. Um, another reason could just be that social setting is going to provide enough protection. So when animals are in herds, it's going to be a lot easier to stay protected than if you're all on your own and don't have anyone to help you. But when they get to be an adult, they're not going to be all that big. They're about two to three inches in length. And they're going to have that really nice um, camouflage to help them blend in, not only um, with that woody debris kind of in the background, but also these kind of gravelly, sandy areas as well. 
And so, like I said, they're a pretty sedentary species. So they spend the majority of their life um, in the same area. Generally, they're going to stay undercover throughout most of the day as well as it's just going to provide more protection for them. So the best time to look for them is likely going to be um, on those summer nights at nighttime um, when they're going to be most active. Um, but it's going to be harder to find them because they like to hang out in the leaf litter and the debris on the ground. So you're going to have to make sure to keep your eyes open and looking at the ground rather than um, at other things. Um, and then also with these species, it can sometimes be easier to find them if you like flip logs or flip rocks. But if you're going to do this, make sure you put the log or the rock back in the same spot. That way um, you're leaving as little trace as possible and not disturbing the habitat that much. Uh, right, so our conclusions for today. Um, elusive habitats or elusive resources are going to lead to elusive wildlife. That just makes sense. So if we have limited resources or habitats and they're scattered throughout the state and they've been separated by mountain ranges, um, the animals that live in those habitats are going to go through all those things as well. So that's part of the reason why we have such unique animals and it's also part of the reason why some of our animals are a lot harder to find. And then we also said um, that groups of animals are going to be a lot easier to observe than the individuals. They're going to stick out a lot more. And then our overall theme, again, is that Nevada's diversity is going to be harder to observe. That's why we're doing this series so that we can um, get more information on our species and where we can find this information um, and then also where we can find these species in the state. So thank you for attending this program. If you are planning on going out and adventuring outside this weekend, make sure to embrace the outdoors and responsibly recreate. Our next elusive program is going to be coming up on Friday, June 8th at 5 p.m. And you can see from these pictures, these are some of the species that are gonna be highlighted, including burrowing owls, since that seems like a pretty uh, popular species. And then we also have a number of upcoming programs. So um, earlier we were talking about the sagebrush obligate species. There is going to be um, a program exploring the sagebrush steppe ecosystem on June 8th. That should be super fun. Um, but also all these other programs are really cool too and we're going to continue to be putting out programs throughout the summer for you guys. So once again, thank you for attending this program. If you have any questions, um, please feel free to email me. Um, also, there is going to be a survey at the end um, when you exit this program. If you wouldn't mind filling that out and giving us feedback, that would be greatly appreciated as that'll help me improve, which I'm always looking to do. Um, so at this point, I am going to take a look at the Q&A. So don't mind if I'm quiet for a minute as I look through these. Um, so someone had a question, is all of Nevada desert? That is not the case, though it does seem like it. Um, so two main deserts are going to take up a lot of Nevada. So that's going to be the Great Basin and Mojave deserts. Um, but there are a number of other ecosystems and habitats that we have in Nevada that are not considered desert habitat or ecosystems. So are there wild leopard geckos in Nevada? As far as I know, we have western banded geckos and then we have long-nosed leopard lizards in Nevada, but I do not believe we have leopard geckos, at least not naturally occurring. So the seminar today is not the same as the one on June 12th. That one will be, um, I believe, the part three, um, which is going to focus on the activity patterns that can make our animals more elusive. Yes, so in my future programs, I'm going to try to kind of create a balance between the different groups of animals I'm highlighting. So I felt like in this one, it was a little bit more bird and mammal heavy. So I tried to put that night lizard in at the end to make sure there was a good reptile representative. Um, but yeah, in the future programs, I'm going to try to make sure I'm giving um, a good amount of information on the different groups we have in Nevada. How common are rattlesnakes in Nevada? They are super common. So we have seven different species, I believe, that live in the state. Um, though in northern Nevada, the only one that gets as far up here is the Great Basin rattlesnake. 
Um, so the majority are going to be concentrated in the lower portion of the state, especially in the Mojave region. Um, but yeah, they are pretty common. Some good places to spot a mountain lion. So mountain lions in Nevada are um, more so associated with the pinyon juniper type habitat. Um, and then they're also going to like kind of more rocky areas. Um, since they are ambush predators, they like to hide out um, and kind of wait for their prey to come out. Um, so as far as I know, any areas in Nevada that I would think have those kind of rocky outcrops, as well as that pinyon juniper type of cover, you should be able to find them, which I know there's definitely some um, around north uh, western Nevada. Can American martins hurt you? So all animals are capable of hurting us. Um, so martins are actually a type of weasel. So if you're gonna ever mess with an animal, I would not recommend it being a weasel as they tend to be very aggressive. And even if they are small, they will hunt and fight things much bigger than them. But all animals are capable of hurting us. So all animals have teeth um, and most are gonna have some type of claw, whether it's dull or it's sharp and they will use it. So if you are gonna go out and view these um, animals, make sure you're doing it responsibly so that you're not close enough that anything could actually hurt you. How common is it for raccoons to try to get into your house? Um, well, I would say that is going to depend on the type of attractants you have and where you live. Um, so as far as I know, raccoons are not going to be as common in the southern portion of the state. They tend to be more associated with water. Um, so if you live in an area that has a bigger water source, and then especially if you have attractants like fruit trees or different berries growing near your house, if you have pet food that you leave outside ever. Um, also chickens, having chicken coops can also attract raccoons. So it kind of depends on um, the amount of attractants that you have and also the type of habitat that you have around you. Um, but I would say that they are one of the more common um, urban species that get into people's houses or whatever it may be, they get into stuff. What are the rarest birds in Nevada? Um, so it kind of depends. So some animals, some of our birds are gonna be more rare because they um, only migrate through and they may stop over once or twice. Um, we also have birds that do not normally migrate along the western portion of the United States that have somehow shown up in Nevada. Um, so there are a number of rare bird species that they're rare for different reasons and most of the time it's just that they don't reside in the state year-round. Um, but even some of our species that do live in the state year round are going to become more elusive just because of the adaptations they have. So I'll be talking about some of those um, later, but I'll try to maybe look up some more um, examples of the rarest birds in Nevada. Do bats and owls get along? Um, not necessarily. Owls eat bats. So <laughs> bats don't, I wouldn't say they, from their perspective, they don't get along. Um, but they are both aerial hunters at nighttime, so they're not necessarily going to be hunting the same thing, but the owls are going to hunt the bats and that's going to cause issues for them. So, hmm. Oh, nice. Someone says they have seen porcupines up in the cottonwood trees in Fallon, Nevada. So that is a super cool um, little point. So if you're going to be looking for porcupines, um, in the near future and you live near Fallon, definitely go up and be checking out those cottonwoods trees that are growing around there. How can I prevent a skunk spraying me? Um, so really skunks do not want to spray us. Um, as soon as they do spray, they become really vulnerable because that spray takes about seven to ten days to replenish. So in that time, they don't have that spray and they're super vulnerable to predators. Um, so in terms of humans, um, my best advice if you come up on a skunk is to first just kind of check out and see what the skunk is doing. A lot of the time skunks are pretty um, oblivious, so sometimes they might not even notice you and you can just slowly back away and they won't even realize that you're there. Um, other times skunks will have warning signs if they have seen you. Um, so they tend to get kind of like a cat, they'll kind of arch their back and get those um, hairs that start to stick up. Um, they'll kind of stomp their little feet and do this little kind of stompy dance, kind of like when a uh, toddler throws a tantrum. Um, and then eventually they're going to turn so that their butt is facing you and they're going to spray you. So 
best way to prevent it is to um, try to, I guess, just pay attention. So make sure you don't get close to them because they can spray up to 15 feet. Um, so definitely maintain that distance and pay close attention. Do any animals in Nevada like to eat sunflowers? Um, yeah, so especially birds, um, any seed eating birds. So crows are gonna be eating sunflowers. Um, different jays are gonna be eating the seeds from the sunflowers. Um, and then there's probably also other animals that are just gonna eat like the flower part and not actually the seeds, but I'm not too sure on those, but we definitely have animals that will eat sunflowers. What is agile? So agile, um, is just agility, so referring to um, the reflexes and how quickly an animal can move around um, and maneuver in its habitat. 